I'm Dustin Richardson from the Burbank International Film Festival, and today we continue our interview series Beyond the Frame with director and producer of Ruby's Choice, Michael Budd. This is a great film. It's a heartfelt story that follows three generations of strong Australian women and stars two-time Golden Globe winner Jane Seymour. It's an official feature film here at BIF, and we're, we're really, really excited to show it this year. So how are you? What's going on? Great. Welcome. Uh, yeah, nice to be here uh, online via Zoom um, and having the opportunity to chat with you today, Dustin. Um, the Burbank Film Festival is such a marvellous film festival. We're uh, honoured to be a part of it. Um, as you know, Ruby's Choice is a very important film to us. It has an important message to share. And we're absolutely, absolutely honoured to be able to share that with the people at uh, Burbank Film Festival uh, in the coming weeks. And uh, so good day from down under. I'm, I'm currently sitting right here in Sydney, Australia, and uh, looking forward to joining you all in Los Angeles in about a week's time. So your film, it's fantastic. And let's get right into it. It's a very touching film full of really great performances from the whole cast. And it presents a, a difficult situation, but it handles it in a very poignant way. It's done so well. So please tell us a little bit about what is Ruby's Choice about? Um, Ruby's Choice. Ruby's Choice is a story, it was loosely based on my grandmother. Um, my grandmother passed away with dementia and Alzheimer's. And uh, Ruby's Choice is a story of Ruby who comes to share a bedroom with her daughter, Tasha or Natasha. And through the course of the film, Natasha finds out things about her family, um, her mum, her grandmother, and she go actually goes from hating her grandmother to loving her once she finds out about more family secrets. And it's, a, it's a really a story of three strong generations of inspiring women. The first generation is Tasha, the granddaughter. Uh, you have Sharon, who plays the mother, played by Jacqueline McKenzie. And then you have uh, the grandmother, who's played by Jane Seymour, uh, who does a wonderful job playing Ruby. You mentioned the connection with your grandmother being part of the inspiration behind this. How did you become involved with the project? Like, how did it all come together? I was presented a script. It was very different than um, anything I'd seen before. It was actually more of a comedy. It was called Grandmother's Coming to Stay. It was written by Paul Mahoney, who was a caseworker. He had worked with people with dementia. Now, as you may not know, in Australia, dementia, Alzheimer's is the number one killer of Australian women. And more than 50% of people don't know what to say to someone with dementia. So when I got the script, I said, hey, there's a lot of drama in here. You know, there's some comedy and there's some drama. I think if we marry the two together, we can treat this film in a way where we can help people know what to say to someone with dementia. I know personally my grandmother, she'd come to join me, at, join us at a family uh uh, cookout, I think you guys call a cookout, we call a barbecue. Uh, she'd come for the barbecue and she'd be like, you know, blowing up, I'm leaving and throw a plate across the room and walk out. And it was hard for everybody, but you know what? We invited her back again because she is the matriarch of our family. She is so important and people with dementia still have a lot to offer and we need to understand how we can talk to them, how we can work with people with dementia. And I think the film tries to do that. It tries to um, enable people to see the full-hearted humaneness in people with dementia and help them understand that side of it. Yes, absolutely. And, and it definitely does that. It, it covers it so well. And like you said, I, I really appreciate the, the balance of drama and comedy in it. I thought that was handled very well. And uh, I think it's very cool that you're able to, to spread that message. Yeah, well, the film was um, financed by one person, Sir Owen Glenn of the Glenn Family Foundation. He was passionate about dementia. He wanted to spread the word of dementia. His, actually, his daughter was the one that recommended he do the film. Uh, Sir Owen Glenn is a great philanthropist who builds universities around the world. He builds wells in, in countries in Africa, things of this nature. And when I sat with him, I just told him how passionate I was that when I lost my grandmother with dementia, she was still so important to us and she had so much to offer. And so when I... When I made Ruby, I wanted Ruby to have that underlying same strength that my grandmother had. So I explained that to Jane Seymour and um, we sat down and we talked about the role for a long period of time. We did Zooms and, and things of this nature. She was extremely passionate about the movie. She came to Australia in quarantine for 14 days um, before making the film. I just love the way that Jane got it and understood that inner strength and um, 
her really clear storytelling. I mean, she's incredible in this movie. Uh, for me personally, this is her best work. I mean, we all know her as Dr. Quinn Medicine Woman. Uh, we all know her as a Bond girl. We all know her from working with Owen Wilson in those uh, kind of lighthearted films. Um, and we know what she can do, but she really went to some great places to tell the story in a really clear way. And I thank her for that. And I'm I'm just marveled at her performances, especially in this film, uh, throughout the course of this film. So for, for, for me, the film was an extension of my life, myself, my dealings with my grandmother. You know, I don't want to tell people too much about the film, but you might recall a scene in in, in the kitchen where where Ruby's looking looking, you know, for for the bathroom and things of this nature. And uh, that was a real life scene from my from my life, you know, um, that that happened in my life, uh, which I put into the film. The other thing is that I actually got to work with a real life dementia patient in the final scenes of the movie. That is a real life grandmother with dementia, and um, uh, she kept forgetting her lines, and uh, we started feeding them from offset. And um, uh, what I remember about her is that she walked onto the set, and I said, "Oh." Um, we're going to be shooting over here. And she said, don't tell me what to do, young man. I've done this before. And because when she was young, she worked in the theatre in her like 20s and 30s. And she was a she was an actress and uh, she got the opportunity to come back and do it all over again. And that spark for life is what we're looking for. So when Sir Owen Glenn decided to, to uh, invest in this movie for this philanthropic piece, uh, we are putting 50% of any profit back into dementia, dementia research and things of this nature. So the film was designed to be a vehicle to get people to learn more about dementia uh, and Alzheimer's. And also if it does generate a profit or what have you, then we would uh, be using that. And we still work closely with um, Dementia Care International uh, where we use promotions. We, um, have fundraising nights and things of this nature. So it's a really special piece to us. So I'm glad that you guys get it. Yeah, I think like there's uh, filmmaking in general, like people make films, popcorn movies, and but then there's something more that we can do with film. You know, over the years, film it helps us program to what we see is to believe is possible, what is real, things that, that can change, can help our community. Like when Ruby's Choice is spread with the wider community, it's going to be able to help people understand what's possible for people with dementia and how we go about working and being around people with dementia. And I think that's the underlying thing that we wanted from Ruby's Choice. We wanted it to be spread with the community and to help people understand more because most of us are going to uh, be touched by dementia in one way or another. And most of the people that were on the project and were a part of this film had been touched in dementia from one way or another. I recall many times shooting the film where people were in tears. And some of them were tears of joy. Sometimes they were tears of anguish, laughing. It was such a, a team of people that were all in on it. You know, we were all in on it because we all believed in, in um, what we wanted to uh, tell in terms of the story. I think um, with this particular film, um, you know, in the past, I made a horror film in 2013, Love of My Life. In 2017, I made a comedy drama with just a bunch of friends, which was a lot of fun. Uh, so I've made all types of budget levels. And then I've got my sci-fi film coming out next year called Enter Sanctum, which I star in. Um, and that'll be available next year. And so I made all types of genre of films. But with this one, it was just very easy for me to to lead it and to understand what we were trying to do it because I've been a part of the process from day one. So I was in charge of, you know, once I got the script, I developed the material. Then I went and sourced finance. That took a long time, you know, ask any producer or director how to go and get finance. And I sourced somebody to finance it. Then I put it into production. Then we had COVID. I was shut down and I had to move from one state to another state, then bring only work with people within my state uh, you know, then have Jane Seymour almost come out, not come out, then come out because of COVID. Then, then I had to have her in uh, isolation. Then when I shot the film, I had to shoot it within a bubble. So we had um, 
no one was able to leave the production bubble for 30 days. We were one of the first innovators in this country in Australia, us and Children of the Corn, which was another big film that was shot at that time, were the only two films that were being shot around COVID. And we had, you know, one way on the set, one way off the set. Everybody had to wear masks. We had to sanitise every hour. We had a dedicated nurse for COVID. We Anywhere we wanted to shoot the movie involved a sterilisation and what they called a COVID clean. So we were paying additional fees to get the film made to because if we wanted to use a space, we would have to have it clean before and after. And, you know, then there was a lot of cancellations. You know, one time we had the fire department booked to be in a scene that, and, you know, they couldn't be there. And there was a lot of cancellations. It was a crazy time to shoot a movie. And so I'm just um, inc incredibly blessed to have worked with a wonderful team. I was able to get through it all, get the product out there that we wanted under the constructs that we had. Yeah, yeah, you know, I've been doing these talks with several filmmakers for the past couple of years and COVID always gets brought up. So um, it's amazing what you guys have been able to do under the circumstances and get a finished product that that you never would have thought happened during that time. So well done for that reason as well. I mean, that must have been very hard and extra stressful to a process that's already stressful at many levels. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. I mean, it's, it is incredibly stressful to make a film. A lot of films don't get finished. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a blessing. It's an honour any time you get a film finished. You make this thing, you put it out there, you don't know what's going to come of it. What I've loved about this film is how America's embraced it. I mean, we have Australian accents in the movie. Maybe it's because Jane Seymour's in the film. She does a marvellous job. In the UK and, and America in particular, they love the movie and they... They laugh in places where we don't laugh in Australia and they cry in places where we don't cry as well. But overall, it's it's, it's very, yeah, it's, it's an amazing thing to watch American audiences watch this movie. They love it and they find a lot of it funny, which is great, which is what I was hoping for. It's a difficult subject to cover, you know what I mean? It's it's dementia, it's Alzheimer's. A lot of times I'd, I'd be at a, a festival somewhere and someone comes to me and say, I'm not going to watch it. My, you know, my mother just died with dementia. It's um, it's too close to home, and I'd say, no, no, go watch it. It's 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 uplifting. It's a story of joy. It's a story of family bonds. It's about love. It's about the spirit inside you, like the the who who we are as an individual. It's more than just. It's not just doom and gloom. It's not a. It's not a two hours of somebody in their demise. I mean, it is showing a demise of a person, but it's showing what they offered to their family as they were going through these things. So it's quite different to what people um, initially think when they think about a dementia film. There are so many funny moments. There are so many beautiful moments. There are so many touching moments. And that's just not from Ruby. That's from the whole family and what they go through. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. And, and like I mentioned before, I love that you gave it all those different emotions and balanced it out because it is very beautiful. And a lot of filmmakers out there now, more than ever, the past few years seem to head a little more darker. So it was very nice to see it not going that way. Thank so, you. I mean, yeah. I felt like I felt like it was easy to go very dark and it was mm -hmm. easy to go very funny. You know, I felt like you could do either one of those things. I felt that the true nature to touch this subject was to be somewhere in the middle. You know, because, look, I mean maybe not yourself in the age, in that age bracket, but as we get older, sometimes we'll walk into the kitchen and we'll be like, what was I wanting? To, what was I looking for uh, in the kitchen? That's funny. You know, like you have a little laugh and you go, oh, it was a tomato. It was, it was the ketchup, you know what I mean? Or, or the salt, you know, and you have a little laugh to yourself. That little laugh and that little moment is what I tried to capture. Um, yeah, no, I see my parents do that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not quite there yet, but sometimes I will when I'm busy. It's like, wait, oh, I was making a sandwich? Okay. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, because exactly. you're, you're juggling a, a bunch of things. Yeah. And I think that's what the journey with dementia can be. It's a lot of thoughts happening at a lot of time and a lot of grappling to remember and following stories, you know, like when more than one person are in a room talking and, you know, you're trying to follow, you know, do you need me? Do what can I, can I help in this? Look, I still, every time I see the movie, um, I, you know, I get emotional um, for obvious reasons. Um, mm -hmm. 
um, uh, and I always I always have a laugh. I find it funny as well. So um, yeah, it's 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 um it's that balance overall is what what I was looking to achieve. How long did it take you to go from pre production to the finished project? Like, well, how long did it take? Sir Owen Glenn at the time when he signed on to finance the movie and to use the Glenn Family Foundation as the facilitator to, to make this uh, philanthropic movie. Uh, it's a philanthropic piece, so it was always designed to to reach out far and wide and 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 be told to as many people. He said he wanted the film made in one year. I mean, this is a global businessman. He said, I want the film made in one year. I said, I can make it in one year. So uh, I developed it pretty quick. I was shooting in Queensland and then COVID hit and then we shut down. So I had to pull the whole production back to New South Wales. And then I said to him, oh my gosh, we've, you know, the, we started production. We, you know, we lost a bit of money because we started production and we had all these people and and now we you know, we can't shoot. And he said, well, you know, work with what you got, you know? And so I was like, okay. So I I called in some people that I'd worked with in the past um, to come on board and they were the local people of me. And then I only cast them within New South Wales. Jane was the only international guest. We were able to, um, you know, start within three months, the pre-production. Uh, it was about a 30 day shoot. We, the post-production process was about four and a half months, I think, post-production. Uh, the music was beautiful from Jamie Fonte. It was beautifully edited and we, we got the film finished. Uh, it was it was made within a year. <laughs> like wow. The actual product was made <laughs> within a year, even with the shutdowns, because I had a contract to honour and I, <laughs> I uh, tend to honour my contracts. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, like, he's a big global businessman, um, you know, and um, foundation and uh, he was in, he was in and out of some health issues and he wanted the film made relatively quick. And I mean, it was, it was a lot, you know, and I, I've never had such a challenge in my life and it's probably now I've been making back to making films that are just a little bit more uh, easy to handle, like uh, smaller yeah, independent films, because I still make films. I make, make one film every year to year and a half. Um, that's kind of my life's calling, I believe is to just to make films. And that's all I do. I, um, I don't do any TV or music videos or anything like that. I just find a piece of material and then I work on it and then I make it. And I don't care if I'm funded by the government or not. I just I um, find people that want to work with me and have like-minded individuals and we put something out and see what the universe thinks of it. And that's um, that's my calling. And what inspired you to become a filmmaker in the beginning? Uh, I was a body double and stand-in for Lawrence Fishburne. I don't, do you know Lawrence Fishburne? He's oh, a, yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. So um, there was a movie called The Matrix that came to Australia and um, I was, I think it was in my 20s, I was 2003. So yeah, I was like in my 20s and um, it came to Australia and it was a big success, 1999 they made it and it was a huge success, The Matrix. And so they came back, Andy and Larry Wachowski, which at that time they were both men, They've now um, transferred to being both women. They brought The Matrix 2 and 3 back and I met with them and um, they were looking for a body double and stand in for Lawrence Fishburne. So I got to work on the project for 250 shoot days. I remember just seeing them all and Bill Pope. Bill Pope was a cinematographer, world-class cinematographer. And they said, oh, Michael, he's a bit taller than Lawrence. Lawrence is only six foot two and I was six foot three. And Bill said, no, 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 well, Lawrence is wearing these little slides. Let him come back and meet Lawrence and see what they think. So I met Lawrence Fishburne and he said, oh, you remind me of my son. You can have the job. We shook hands. And um, I ended up doubling for Lawrence Fishburne for 250 shoot days uh, on Matrix 2-3. was one of the best times of my life. I would sit there just watching the directors work meticulously every day, writing notes down. Um, and then they gave me a role as a Zion controller in in, in um, the Matrix Reloaded. And I said to Lawrence, oh, I think I'm going to become an actor and a director. And he said to me, he used to joke with me, he goes, darling, if you want to be an actor, you need to go to London and learn Shakespeare. And I was like, Shakespeare? What the hell is Shakespeare? So I went to London and I, I um, worked in an office for a little bit doing selling advertising space. And I put myself through drama school. I learned the Meisner technique and um, I studied acting. Then I got to play Othello in the West End and works of Shakespeare. I did mammoth plays and 
I learned about staging with Scott Williams. He was He's a famous Meisner coach who works out of London. Spent nearly three years studying drama and staging and um, then came back to Australia and became a filmmaker. And I, and that was that was my story. Wow. Fantastic. That's awesome. And I love the Matrix films. So that's very cool that you were a part of that. One of the great experiences of my life. Yeah, that's great. And yeah, getting to be on set, I'm sure you learned a little bit of everything, getting to see everybody give it their their best to make that happen. They are one of the great filmmakers, I believe, of all time, in my opinion, uh, the Wachowski brothers, to me. They are, they are special, special uh, filmmakers. Oh, yeah, they, they completely changed cinema with The Matrix when that came out. I mean, the famous bullet dodge scene. I mean, that yeah. changed the world. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my gosh. The, the, yeah, their ideas, the way they would work. And you know, I can tell you a funny story about them, actually. They're big basketball fans. And uh, they had like four splits. You know, most directors, we have just one video split. They had like second unit here, two screens, you know, first unit here. And then on that screen, they had the NBA playoffs going. And I said to myself, damn, if this is filmmaking, I can make a movie and watch the NBA playoffs at the same time. I'm in. That's what I want to do. (laughs) Admittedly, I've never been able to have more than a couple of screens and I've never been able to watch any sporting events whilst making a film. <laughs> I think that's saved for the chosen few, but it was um, it was that kind of level that they were at. And it was really, really special to watch them do their thing and how they work. That's awesome. Well, one day you're getting there. You'll be able to watch <laughs> that soon. <laughs> oh, keep my fingers crossed for you. That's hilarious. <laughs> And uh, here's a question I'd just love to ask all our guests because everybody has a different background and, and a different journey to where they are today. So what advice would you give to any aspiring filmmakers out there today trying to find their place in this industry? Uh, well, actually, I have a quote that is my quote. Um, it'd probably be on my IMDb and people close to me know it. I always say start with an open heart and an open mind. But most of all, start. That is excellent advice. Thank you for sharing that. That's awesome. Pleasure. You mentioned a little bit about what's next for you. Is there anything else you'd you'd like to mention that you have in the works in the future? I'm hoping to be back at Burbank in uh, 2024, maybe with my sci-fi film, Enter Sanctum. I will also want to let fans know that uh, my short film uh, is playing at Burbank as well, which we didn't talk about today. Um, I star in that. It's called The Beginning. Uh, It'll be on in the sci-fi Bot, um, which I believe is on the Saturday, where all the sci-fi shorts are playing. I play Kevan, an alien from space. It's a great short film, about 15 minutes long. Come and check it out. And, uh, you know, I'm still acting. Uh, I love acting. I'm, I'm still doing that. And, and I'm also directing as well. But um, come and see the beginning as well. Come and see Ruby's Choice on the closing night. And I uh, look forward to uh, meeting anyone in person. Um, I'm looking forward to having some great conversations with people. Great, Michael. And my last question is just for those who won't be able to attend the festival, but want to see Ruby's Choice, how might they be able to do that? Is it going to be released anytime soon or in any way? Yeah, wonderful news. There's actually been a lot of talk around a limited theatrical release, so there will it will be playing in cinemas, and then it's going to move on to streaming in early 2024. So from early 2024, please look at it on it on all your normal streaming sites stay tuned uh always our facebook page we're always updating and letting people know uh and on on instagram as well we're always letting people know um about the film and um we're looking forward to sharing it with the the wider community shortly great i'm very happy to hear that yeah everybody who's watching this video make sure to see ruby's choice it's a great film michael thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me i really appreciate it It was great meeting you and congratulations on everything you've had so many amazing accomplishments Likewise, Dustin, it was a pleasure to talk to you today. And thanks again for the opportunity. You bet. And for viewers out there who will be attending the festival and you would like to see Ruby's Choice, it's going to be on the big screen at the Burbank International Film Festival on Sunday, September 24th, 1.30 p.m. It will be followed by a Q&A. It's going to be a lot of fun, so be there. You can get your tickets and learn more at burbankfilmfest.org.